behold, I am coming soon. Between the years of 1984 and 1999, Apostle Alfred Williams was taken to heaven on various occasions where he was shown global events that would lead up to the year of 2015. And in 1999, the Apostle was powerfully shown the coming calendar for the world. I want you to understand that the first war was in heaven, the first victory was in heaven, and it takes the man of heaven to win the earthly battle. In December 2009, God instructed Apostle Alfred Williams to go into all the world and let them know that I am coming. Beloved, with this powerful instruction behind us, it is now time for us to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Now is the time for the final preparation of the Bride of Christ, a final trumpet call to righteousness in this time that is running out before the rapture of the church. Join us on this dynamic campaign to reach every house in Britain. They need to hear the call. Who will tell them if we do not? This is the prophesied time of harvest. It is now time for us to win every house for Jesus. For more information, call 020 7635 0447 or visit cftchurches.org. The time has come to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon. Spanning four decades, Apostle Alfred Williams has experienced numerous encounters with Jesus Christ and his holy angels, including being shown global events leading up to the year of 2015. Now, for the first time in this life-changing book, My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels, you can discover not only what was shown to the Apostle, but also how you can receive heavenly encounters for yourself. My Encounters with Jesus is a very powerful book. The Lord has taken me to heaven in the presence of the Father, a few times where decisions were made over nations. Apostle Alfred Williams is General Overseer of Christ Faith Tabernacle International Churches. He is a prophetic mouthpiece to nations, raising countless leaders and planting many churches. He has seen hundreds of signs and wonders, led huge scale crusades which have resulted in the salvation of many. Your life can change today. Get your copy of My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels by visiting cftchurches.org now. If you can only buy one book this year or are thinking of giving a life-changing gift to friends or family, make sure it is Alfred Williams' My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels. Also coming soon, don't miss Apostle Alfred Williams' four new groundbreaking titles, Shepherding God's People, Come Let Us Reason Together, The Minister's Manual and The Power of the Mind. If you can only buy one book this year, make sure it is Alfred Williams' My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels. But I have to teach you what heaven has taught me over the night today. This is one of the unusual nights I have in the land of the living. A night when the Lord refused me to have a sleep. And whenever the Lord deprived me from sleeping, that I get to my bed and I could not sleep. I recognize that God wants me to stand in gap and also to commune with him. So I resolved to do that. And when I resorted to do that, I discovered that I could not sleep till this hour. That I'm standing before you, but I'm stronger than many of you listening to me. I was before this altar at the early of the hours to seek God on your behalf. And on behalf of his church on earth, and this is what the Lord gave me from that fellowship with him. Some things I begin to teach you from this hour. There are people who will be hearing me on the television or across the globe who I will say that um, it will reaffirm what you believe. And to some other people that could be a little bit of, is it really true? But I will tell you what. If what I'm reading to you, I'm going to teach you now, is what Jesus said himself. It is nothing but the truth. Whatever the Bible says is true, even when you have not encountered it. Christian life is a life where you come in as being saved as a baby. Like when a woman gets pregnant and gives birth to a child. That child has all the abilities that he will manifest when he's fully grown. But he cannot... Because the child needs to go through a course. 
isn't it? But then to deny that child of all the abilities of a man will be strange and be untrue. He's a man and he has all the abilities. But one thing I will let you understand also in the, in the realm of spiritual, abilities can be released. The ma major difference between spiritual and physical is that abilities can be released by being educated, which is similar to you feeding a child and is growing. So as you are fed the word of God, you grow and you come to a place where you become a man. From a baby to a child to a man. Unto us, <laughs> unto us, what is born and what is given. So you discover that there's a difference between a child, a son is given, a child is not given. In the, in the segment of your child, you have the baby segment and you have the child segment. But then you grow to manhood and become a son, both male and female. But in the spiritual, a baby, the strangest thing is that a baby operating by faith, can release the power of sonship. That's the major difference between human baby and spiritual baby. In the spiritual, you grow into becoming a son, a man. And in the stage of a man, there are various stages of manhood too, in the spiritual. But the distinction between spiritual and physical is that a baby in the physical cannot release power. But a baby in the spiritual can by operating in faith. So if a baby was grown in a, in a place where there's a father of faith who operates in the power, the baby will just emulate the father and power will be released. And so today I want to begin to teach you about that man Jesus. And throughout this week we'll be, looking, we'll be looking into the life of Christ because this is the week we're having Jesus seminar from Wednesday till Friday. And on Saturday, we are going to finish it with um, the, uh, what do you call it now, Christmas carol, singing, singing to Jesus about Jesus in the cathedral. <laughs> now, it says, that man Jesus, let's look at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I want to focus on the ministry of Jesus Christ and you. That is what you may call it, the ministry of Jesus Christ and me. That's the topic of this message. Now, in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Now, let us look at this. You know, when Jesus Christ came to the world, uh, he performed a lot of miracles. I don't want to talk much about the miracles in this service, but we will talk about that um, when we meet within Wednesday to Friday. To Friday, we will look into the active ministry of Christ. But we look at if you get to go into the book of Mark from chapter one to chapter five, you will discover that the onset of the whole book of Mark talks much about miracles that Jesus did, whereas the book of Matthew and the book of Luke began by talking about the visitation that led, led to his conception and his birth and genealogy. And then one began to talk very much about angels because of the kind of people he's, uh, he's addressing to. But if you look at the book of Mark from chapter 1 to 5, it tells you quite a lot of uh, information about miracles of Christ. The first miracle that was recorded by Mark is the miracle of he going into the temple and meeting the person who was mad. And he casted out a demon from that person. He healed the mad person. And the whole book of Mark, you will see Jesus Christ healing the mad a few number of times. You will hear about Jesus Christ healing the epileptic. You will hear about Jesus Christ healing the blind in chapter 12. Epileptic in chapter 9. And you will hear about Jesus Christ raising the dead. Of course, around the whole gospel. And there is something you will know about this issue. When Jesus Christ manifested, before Jesus was manifested, he wasn't known. But the moment Jesus manifested, Luke chapter 4, 
verse um, 14. It says, after Jesus had been tempted and, and stuff, he returned. Jesus returned into Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread. Now, you will discover that it is power manifestation that spread the news of the Son. Now, when I'm look, looking at Christ and you, we are looking at Christ. Anything you see that happened to Christ should happen to you. But in looking at it, we see the key that brought the manifestation. I'm preparing you for next year, onslaught, the visitation of God coming from 2013 into 2015. For those whose hearts are connected. And I want everyone in this house not to be left behind. I don't want anyone to be left behind in this move. Now, believe what I tell you. Anything that happened to Jesus should happen to you and I. But in looking at the things that happened to Jesus, we will look at what propelled it. So in the area of this, it says Jesus returned to, to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Now we learn from here that the power of the Spirit, before that time, people don't know Jesus apart from his local area. And it was mentioned that, of course, in the church he was known by the teachers. Because while he was 12, he was um, very outstanding in the knowledge of the word. But so after the Spirit came upon him, the Bible says the news of Jesus spread throughout the whole countryside. So the power of God is what can spread your news. If any other thing spread the news of a child of God or a man of God, apart from the power of God, that news is temporary. It will not last with you your lifetime. After a while, they will tell stories that when, God, when you used to be this, but when you see a man that's, you know, there's manifestation in his life and the news of the, the person spread all over and that person maintained that high till death, it is because it is a manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit. But what is behind the power of the Holy Spirit for Jesus Christ? That is the book of um, Acts 10, 30 that I read to you. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and with power. And this is what gave birth to that uh, book of Luke chapter 4 verse uh, 14. But if you look at that Acts 10, 38, it says God anointed Jesus Christ with Holy Spirit and power. The next thing it says that, and how, you see the two hows there, he went around what? Okay, I think that tells us that when the power comes upon a man, you can never be stable in a place. Power is not meant for you to sit down in the church. The reason why many people in Christianity do not see power, you will see it as we go along here within the next 10 minutes, is because power changes motion. That is the scientific definition of power. Power is a force that changes motion. If somebody was stationary and a power is applied to you, you start, be, you start moving. That's what releases kinetic energy. But if something is on, his, on a motion and a power, greater power, you know, hits it, that motion stops, it freezes. Power changes whatever state of motion a man is. But we, also, we all know that we are all stationary, but when the power of God comes upon us, you cannot sit in the church and experience manifestation because power is released in motion. Do we get it now? Are we together? Okay, so you can begin to see the reason why some of us are not manifesting in power. Because when the power comes upon, when it came upon Jesus, he went around. Take note of that. But when he went around doing good, what good was he doing? The Bible says he was preaching the kingdom. He was preaching about the kingdom of God. That was his main message. Jesus never preached several sermons like us do. Because he was sent by God to just preach the kingdom. And he came only to reveal the kingdom. And he hammered on the kingdom until the kingdom is totally understood. You must not misunderstand this, that Jesus did not, some may say that Jesus majored in a particular area. He did not. He did not. In the preaching of the kingdom is the holistic message. Now, the message God sent Jesus is to preach the kingdom and reveal the kingdom, that the kingdom of God has come upon men. And show man how to enter into the kingdom so that mortal men can enter the kingdom. But the, 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 the commission he gave us is to preach the whole scriptures. Are we together now? So Jesus' mandate is different. It's salvation unto all men. But our, we, 
And Jesus had three years to do that before he departed. But we have all the years to stay in this world. To preach the kingdom holistically. That is salvation and development of every mankind. From baby to manhood. I we together. But if you look at this scripture, it says, He went around preaching the kingdom or doing good. And while he was doing good, what happened thereafter? In that 38? Yes. He went around doing good and speaking loud. Let me hear you again. Jesus went about doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil. So then, every Christian can heal all who are under the power of the devil if you can go about doing good. I'm not talking about giving people money for funding all this charity. That, no, 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 no. Preaching the gospel is the good that Jesus did. But what really led Jesus? Did Jesus just come one day and he woke up and was preaching the gospel? No. Let me show you what's constituted to the success of Jesus Christ in preaching the word of God. If you look at the book of Luke chapter 2 verse 40, 41. I will read 41 to 47. It says, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. 42. Luke chapter 2. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on, on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. Verse 45. When they did, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now on the line, verse 46. After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Listen to me. And verse 37 says, everyone who had him was amazed at his understanding and his answer. Do you know that the first fundamental key to the success of Christ after the power, after God has ordained Jesus that he would do all what he did was the parents. You know, a lot of parents always wish their children to become great, especially God's children, believers. But you know what? I will show you the key to wisdom in this meeting. It is the key to power. It is the key to wisdom. The Bible says, teach your child in the way that it will go. When it grows up, it will not depart from it. The, the parents of Jesus Christ, the Bible reveals here, they were people who go to church regularly. They never miss convention. The Passover was, a, was an annual convention. When it's an annual convention, they all take holiday from their work. Because it says that, you know, the Passover feast takes about seven days or so. And they will all be there throughout that week, refreshing themselves before the Lord. They were people who really served and worshipped God. They were not just churchgoers who so manifest on Sundays and then disappear the rest of the week. Or who will go on their own ways or holiday, wherever, when God calls for an annual convention. Many do not understand that annual convention in any church is different from ordinary service. Annual conventions are specific time that God has instructed a covenant period to meet with his children. And that's the reason why unusual manifestations happen in annual convention. You read about Anna in the Shiloh and many others. But we see here that the, the, the parents of Jesus Christ took him to church. Regardless of the fact that angel appeared to them and told them about who Jesus is, 
They still took Jesus to church. Parental part is very, very vital. Second thing is this. Jesus was 12 years old. So there is no such a thing as my baby is resting at home. There are some people who just, you know, they will go to church sometimes and say, ah, my, my, baby, my baby has to sleep at 8, has to sleep at 9. Do you know something? <laughs> I know a place where people don't sleep till 4 a.m. It's emergency ward. I know a place where people don't, don't haste to go home. When something strikes a child in, in about 9 o'clock, you call the ambulance or about 10, at least in England, I can say this. You get to the emergency. If that child can walk with his leg, if he's not gasping for breath, and they have put in all the gadgets on him, the earliest time you see a doctor will be three hours. If you are extremely lucky. What they always say to us in hospital is that they are short of staff in the night. And most times you will spend five good hours. It is, I have, it's happened to me, not once, not twice, and I have sampled other people the same thing they experience. But you know something? If we will not withdraw from going to the hospital in the midnight, how could we stop brain night vision? And you are coming to night vigil and you want your child to sleep at home. How could you come to just an evening meeting of 7 o'clock to 9 or 10 and you think that your child should sleep at 8 before God? When that child grows up, when God needs the child, the, that child is not educated to be sensitive to God. His sleep is his God. And such parents will find it hard to get that child fulfilled destiny. Jesus was taken to the Passover. And another thing is this. When Jesus got to the Passover, the Bible says here that um, after three days, they left him for three days. They had been going. They thought he was with the team, you know, family and friends. And after three days, they found out that this man, this, <laughs> this young man, where is he? And they were looking around for him. They couldn't find him. They came back to the to the. To the uh, 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 church, but when they entered the church, he was arguing. He was, he was, he was. The Bible says he was listening to the teachers and he was questioning them. Now this is it. Therefore, Jesus Christ was a young boy who read the scriptures so much. He studied the scriptures so much to the extent that when he came before the teachers who have lectured the scripture for years. And he asked them a question, and they explained that question. When Jesus will respond, the depth of knowledge Jesus had transcended the ability of the, of the teachers of the scripture. But you know something? Did it happen to Jesus because Jesus was the Son of God? No, 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 no. When he was when he was on earth, he was total man. And we know that as theologians too. The Bible says he left what all, all of his godhood in heaven and he took completely the image and the nature of man. And the Bible says that he was flesh and blood like us so that he can bear with us in our human, you know, you know ailment or weakness and weaknesses. He took on completely the image of man. And he had to walk his way like you and I will walk our way. And at the age of 12, he knew all the scriptures. I remember something that inspired my own family. It can be helpful to you. Those of you who are just producing children. When we are taking our children to, to, to school, in the primary school, we will be asking them the memory verse for that day. Because their mother will give them memory verse and stuff. And that child must read it. Every day. The scriptures that we study, we will ask them, read it, and they will read it. We will sit together when they were babies. We will read the Bible together as a family. And I will ask each member of my household to tell me what you understand. I want to hear my baby explain the scriptures to me. So when they grew up, it is not a problem to understand the scripture. Because they were grown with it. They didn't know novels. They didn't know, you know all these uh, books all over. Apart from what they teach them in school. In my house is the scripture. It is the book that produces wisdom. 
And this is what happened to Jesus Christ at the age of 12. Now, if you look further, it says, He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Now, it says, Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answer. This is what the parents helped him to become. And he himself, at a very tender age, had read the whole scripture at 12. Now, let me say this. Has this to do with the power of God? Yes. Because we soon understand, very literally, that the power of God manifests when the word is preached. You carry the power, but the power cannot manifest when there's no bedrock for it. Are you with me now? It is like if you have a car and you have the key to the car. And if you don't put that key into your ignition and switch it to on, on, you know, grad, it will never ignite. Because behind that ignition, they have connected power to the ignition and they leave, leave, leave them, you know, I and o, o and 1, 1 and 0. So that, so that you know, when the, when the car is off, is at zero. Somebody had to turn the key before the engine starts. But as long as you sit there, let's assume that even you don't have the key and you are in the car, it does not manifest. If you have the key in your hand, until you switch it on, it cannot. So is the word of God. The word of God is the bedrock for the manifestation of power because if you don't know the word of God and you meet people, you don't know what to tell them. And this is the reason why studying the word of God to show yourself a proof of man is the fundamental basis. You know the reason for recklessness in the church is lack of knowledge of the word. The reason for many sins in the church is lack of knowledge of the word. People don't understand consequences of some attitudes and some actions and they do it. And then they suffer it. Because they do not know the word of God concerning that kind of behavior. And let me say this to you. God wants the church to stop that. There is a place where, and there is something I saw here when I was reading, of a good number of things, but there is one I saw here when I was reading, it blew my mind. You know, you can live a life free of sickness. I will come there in a minute. If sickness comes, you can handle it. If you pray for the sick and the sick get healed, and sickness attack you, what will you do? You pray! Because you know how to get the sick healed. Isn't it? You cannot be a person, even if they give birth to you with a deformed heart. You operate in the power of healing. Uh -uh. The gifts cannot walk through you and bless somebody. And then leave you unblessed. It's a matter of time. He will, he will turn back to you and heal you. And there are a good number of us who are believers who have some sicknesses and ailments. That we have accepted as part of us. And those sickness and ailment are hindering us. Many great things we will have done. We could not do because of this incapacity. But you can be free from it. Let me show you. So we see here in that scripture the role of parents. We see that Jesus attended the church regularly. We see also that Jesus sought God at the age of 12. So there's no issue that I'm young. He sought God at the age of 12. We see that Jesus studied the scripture under teachers of law. He has a spiritual instructor, a pastor, who knows the word of God well, thorough. And they really know the word of God. And he sat under them to be taught. Though he is the writer of the word. But yet he submitted himself to be taught by man the word. Who are you? The men he has appointed. If anybody is a Christian in the world and he does not have a pastor that you report to, you can't go too far. The last thing is that he understood the scriptures. Jesus understood, understood the scripture because he did not read the scripture. He spent time, quality time, day and night digging into it and studying it. Therefore, if you study the Bible, you will grow in wisdom. What is the result of Jesus' studying of the Bible? 
verse 52 says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. Anybody who studies the word of God, as you grow in stature daily, you will grow in the wisdom of God. That is, I'm talking about studying the Bible to apply it to your life. Studying the Bible to apply it to your life. If you do that, you will grow, as you grow in stature, you will grow in knowledge, and you will have favor before God and men. If you're having problem favor with men, check your obedience to God. I tell you the truth. Because the Bible says that if a man's way pleases God, he makes even, he, said, he didn't say he makes his enemies, he makes even his enemies, and the word even mathematically means plus. After all have been your friends, your enemy will also now bow to you. If a Christian is having problems and they are picking on you, they are hindering you, they are fighting you, men, and check your life of obedience. Don't take it as God. God doesn't do that. Because he didn't do that to Jesus. So what didn't happen to Jesus can happen to you. When you study the word of God, you study it to apply it to yourself. Let me say something to you now. That is, exchange your reasoning with the word of God. Exchange your mind with the word of God. There is no more such a thing as, this is what I feel. You don't feel nothing. Your feeling can be sincere and sincerely deadly. That is human feeling. Really, <laughs> most of us have been killed by our feelings. Is that not true? Uh -huh. Our feeling led us to the misery that we have. All right. Now, let me take you very quickly to the mind of Christ. You know, we understand that Jesus went about healing the sick and, you know, you know, I was reading in Luke chapter 5 where they, they opened the roof and they brought in a cripple to Jesus and Jesus healed the cripple. The crowd went to a house that Jesus entered. They, they climbed their roof because they couldn't come in. The crowd was too much. They climbed the roof. They removed the roof of somebody. They don't care what the damage is until they drop that. They, they drop. They located the exact place Jesus was sitting by looking at the door, through the door. Then they went to the roof and they came in and opened the roof and dropped that person. Can you imagine the owner of the house just hearing bah, bah on his roof? He couldn't go out because the crowd were so much, so many. And then when they, what's happening, what's happening? But Jesus knew what was going on. And then they dropped the man down. And the man was not taken back with what brought him down. He went out with his feet on his legs. That is Jesus. He, went, he was walking one day and he met a woman who, in the church who was bent over all his life walking like that. And when Jesus saw that woman, Jesus said, Woman, loose! And the woman, the back sprang up instantly. He was walking one day uh, and he came to a procession of a funeral. A widow whose, last, whose only son died. And as they were carrying the coffin, going, Jesus stopped the coffin. And you know, people who are carrying coffee will be wondering, what's, what's the matter with this man? Can't you respect the dead? And Jesus said, yeah, I want to give him the last respect. And he touched that dead body, which is an abomination. A Jew, a rabbi must not touch corpse. He was walking one day. He raised that boy from the dead and gave it back to the mother. I can imagine what will have happened to the whole people who were who were called the funeral. Now, one day he was walking. It is an abomination for a Jew to touch a leper. And he saw a leper. Where everybody run away from leper. And the lepers, you know, their own heart was, you know, uh, if he can just speak, we, we are all right. You know, because nobody should touch us. We are leprous. And the Bible says that Jesus walks through to the leper and touched the leper. I am very sure when the Bible says that Jesus touched the leper, he will hug that leper. And the power in his body, as he got in contact with that leper, instantly all saw in the body vanished. That is Jesus for you. Are you with me now? Now, what is the goal? What, what, what is the goal of Jesus' life? Because the goal of a man is what drives him in everything he does. If you do anything without a goal, you never get a success. Success only comes because somebody has a focus in life and a particular goal that he has to achieve. When I was looking at the scripture that, look, this mystery man, Jesus Christ, I mean, what really is behind all these things that he does? And I found out in John chapter 3, verse 34, 
He says, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Two things about the goal of Jesus, which all of us should adopt. The will of God and the work of God. The will of God and the work of God. Understand, the will of God is not as he thinks. It's as it is written. He set his mind that in every aspect of his life, the will of God must prevail. Not as he thinks in his heart. Or as he thinks that the Holy Spirit, I think Holy Spirit is leading me to do this. No, 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 no. What is written? It is what is written. He read the scriptures to the extent that he discovered himself in the Bible. And when those prophecies about him is achieved, he tells people that now this has been fulfilled. When the second one is said, he said, this has been fulfilled. And at the end of his ministry, when all has been fulfilled, the Bible says that Jesus says, it is finished. And then he gave you his ghost. He refused to die. He was, the torture Jesus went through on Calvary, the, the beginning of the torture is enough to kill him. They ripped up the whole of his cage, rib cage. You know, they beat his his, his, his body to shred. But he can't die because there are still more prophecies to be fulfilled. He's, he hasn't taken the vinegar. He hasn't been stripped naked. They haven't put the crown on his head back so that he can go back to Genesis and destroy the, the curse that came by crown. Then he turned the tiny crown. Jesus continued until he came to a place where the cross was so heavy he fell to the ground. And somebody had to carry the cross. He is not supposed to be able to reach this, the, the, the Golgotha. But he held his life by himself. He says, I gave my life and I took it back. So he endured the hardship because everything God wrote about him must be accomplished. Listen to me. Will and work. Let me say something about the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew what he was called to do because he was, the Bible says, How God anointed Jesus Christ with all the goods and power. He was doing good. He was sent. Isaiah said it, it, it unto us a child is born, it, it, unto us a child son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, and you know, you know the, the crown of thorn and all stuff. He knew his work. Let me say something to you, every one of you now, apart from applying this to your spiritual life, if you apply it to your secular life, you will succeed. The will and the work. You must know your work. You must know what God sent you to do for spiritual. Am I talking about ministry? No. What has God sent us to do? As spiritual. Look at the book of Matthew chapter 28 verse, verse 18. What did he say? He says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then he says, what? Therefore, go and make what? Disciples of what? Baptizing them. And, and, and look at the next verse quickly. Are you part of them? Are you part of those he has sent? Yeah, he said to the whole church, every Christian. That's why I say that if you're a baby, you are born today, you can do this. Somebody got saved today. What is the evidence that you can do that? You know, there's a woman in chapter 4 of John. She just met Jesus and Jesus converted her right on the spot. The moment Jesus converted her right on the spot, he doesn't know much. She only knew what Jesus said as at the time. And she went away from Jesus and went to a town and the whole city got saved through her. She was not given the gift of evangelists. She was not called to the ministry of evangelists. Like some of us may be. But this woman just got saved and she got excited with her mouth. She told everybody. If you can do the same thing, people will turn to Christ. You don't need to be mature. You don't need to go to Bible school to do that. What the pastor taught you on Sunday is enough. What he taught you in the midweek is enough. What you read in your devotion is enough. But if you look at this scripture, therefore, Jesus says, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of age, but the condition is that you will go and preach the gospel. 
Now, I told you that a baby can operate in healing because a baby now, we, can, we have established that a baby can preach the gospel. Yes? Okay, look at the book of Mark. Chapter 16, verse 20. What does it say? Shall we read together? Stop. I don't like that way you are reading. Say it again. Stop. Where did they preach? Where did they preach? In the market? In the office? In the train? In the bus? On the streets? Everywhere they went, they preached. Go and litter the whole of nations with preaching of Christ. Go and do it. What is the benefit of it? Look at the next line. What did he say? The Lord walk with them. The Lord walk with them and confirm his work with what? With signs that accomplish it. Excuse me. How many of you want the Lord to work with you? We all want the Lord to work with us. But for the Lord to work with us, we have to work for him. Somebody had to go and preach the gospel. Somebody had to be filled with the desire that I must not die until I have worked for the Lord. And all my life must be in accordance to the written word, the will. There are many Christians who are going about saying to people that give me a word from God. You don't need any word anymore. You have the Bible. You don't read it. You're asking for a word from God. Uh, because somebody says a prophet, that's why they give you the word of man. Which crash-landed many of you. That's why they give you the word and they get you some, you pay some fee for it. Listen to me. You want God to confirm his word in your life? Preach! Everywhere, tell about Jesus. Every time, talk about Jesus. Don't be afraid to tell any human being about the one who created them. Regardless of what it threat, if anybody threatens you, go back to Jesus and tell Jesus that I've just preached you here. Why did they threaten me? And he will handle them. He created them. He put breath of life in their noses. There is no threat of man that can overcome a Christian who preaches the word. There is no witch or wizard of power under heaven that can affect a Christian who preaches the word. Because a Christian who preaches the word have angels. The more you preach the word, the more angels will increase that are following you. I tell you the divine truth. Not only from the scripture, from my own personal encounter. If a Christian decides to go into a dangerous place to preach the word of God, instantly the military of heaven surrounds you. You, you don't need to see them. They are there. In the time when you command something to happen, they are the ones who make it happen. In the time the ministry angels make them happen, when people decide to attack you, it is the warrior angels that hinder them. They will neutralize their power. People may have an intention and decision to kill you, and they will touch their mind, they will, the whole of their brain, they will forget. Until when you finish what you are doing and you are gone, they will not remember, oh, we wanted to kill him. Why didn't we? Even we are serving him food and we are even, you know, hugging him. Because the devil knows that that's our destiny. That is the reason why he fights with us so much not to open our mouths. But when it comes to talk, we open our mouths. Some of us, when it comes to gossip, we are the spin. Arguments, our bone will rise. Even we will argue so passionately. Over what we know, your view does not mean is the truth. Are we together? It's just our view. And our view you know, has a lot of things, factors around it, including our exposition. Isn't it? And we will talk, we will cry, over argument, fight over argument, do malice over argument, but to preach the gospel, we are done. Why? Because the devil knows that whenever a person preaches the gospel, everywhere God must walk for that person. God must walk. You see, let me say, in, in closing this very this section, I want to show you some, something that is what I, I said, something blew my mind. I knew it, but tonight I knew it better. Look at the book of John chapter 15 verse 16. Let me show you. This is where I'm going to stop this very lecture. In the book of John chapter 15 verse 16, let's read together. You did not choose me, 
both I, uh -huh. yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Let me say something to you. Those of you who are academically minded, let me talk to you a little, a little more about what the scripture is saying. And we're going to stop there today. You know, you and I can become anything great under heaven. You and I can be extremely blessed under heaven, only on one condition. You and I can be extremely successful without any mortal man able to hinder it. Impossible. Only on one condition. Look at what he says here. You did not choose me. You didn't come to this church because you decided to come. Holy Ghost brought you here. Those of you who listen to me in various churches in the world, you never chose the church you went. Holy Ghost led you there. You didn't come to salvation because you wanted Jesus. It is he himself that brought you to himself. But he says, this is a purpose. I appointed you, I chose you and appointed you because I chose you and appointed you to what? To go. Not to sit in church. Go. As you sit in church daily. Go. Go also. Go. Tell somebody. Yeah. I appointed you to go. And do what? And bear fruit. Correct? Now, what is the fruit that you bear? It's salvation. It's not talking about fruit of the Spirit. This is not talking about fruit of the Spirit. It's not talking about meekness. It's not talking about gentleness. It's not talking about the virtues. It's talking about you, a human being, giving back to a fruit. A tree of apple. When it's fruitful, what does it give back to? Orange give back to what? Born again give back to what? That's what God is saying. Bear fruit after your kind. Lead somebody to Jesus and educate him and disciple him, as Jesus said in chapter 28, verse 20. That's what he's saying. And then, do you know, this is what blew my mind. Then, the word then means that is the condition, precondition. If you fulfill this precondition, God said, then I will do the second one. Any man who does the first one, God says, I will now do the second one. What is the second one? It says, the father... Because you are fruitful, the Father will what? Give. I, I can't understand. The Father will give you what? No, some things that you ask for. No, 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 no. A little bit of what you ask for. No, 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 no. I think that scripture says, then the Father will give you and I everything we ask for. Yeah? Okay. So if we can't get everything we ask for, it's because we haven't borne fruit enough. If we don't get everything we ask for, we are not bearing fruit because the condition is bear fruit. So when you go to God and say, God, do this for me, do this for me, most of the things that you're asking for, God says, where is the fruit? Show me the fruit and this come. Show me the fruit. That will come. There are other things that God just gives us. Even he gives some people who are not born again, natural things. He, he sends rain upon them. He delivers them sometimes and all stuff like that. But the great things that we got to get from God comes because of our fruit. Our fruit-bearing life attracts manifestations from God. One of it is the miracles that I read to you. Okay? And if you look at the essence of this, this uh, chapter, chapter 15 of, 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 um, of uh, John, look at verse 4. And let me show you something very quickly. What is it in verse 4? It says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruits by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you what? Remain in me. So simple. What is remaining in Christ is remain in the word. In the beginning was the word, John chapter 1 verse 1. The word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. By him all things we are made. And nothing was made among the things that was made. And if you go down to verse uh, 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 14, I suppose, of John, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only uh, one and only who came from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. So when Jesus says, you cannot bear fruits, you can't lead people to Christ, you can't reproduce yourself 
unless you abide in the word. That's why at age 12, he was in the word. So when he became 30, easy. Easy. Somebody said that I had a dream. I was preaching and the whole stadium was filled. Many people died and they were buried in the grave. Who had better dream that they, they would just speak, dead bodies were rising, but nothing happened in their life. Because your dream is not what is important. It's you abiding in the world. Now! Not taking decision out of your anger, out of your curiosity, out of somebody's pressure. Just take decision about your life because of somebody who is senseless somewhere, used by the devil somewhere, put a pressure on you, and you derail. You took decisions that you will now, you will now pay for. No, 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 no. If you abide in the world, there is nobody's pressure. There is nothing under heaven that can make you misbehave because you will, you will check everything that happened according to the word. Let me say something to you. I've told you many things about how Satan abused the mind of believers. The simplest one of it, I told you, I think last week or so, when I was sharing with you about your mind, this man must not believe anything about this woman except what he had known. I don't know this woman, you know, as old as he knows, the, because it's his wife. So if I come now and give an opinion about her to him, which is a terrible opinion, which he hasn't seen the wife do it before, if he decides to act on this woman because of my opinion, he had made himself a fool. But that is what many Christians have done. And I said this to you, therefore, if you hear anything about somebody who is your own friend, go to him and tell that to your friend. This person said this to me about you. Bring that person to him if you have. You, just invite the person that. Just, just escort me out. Don't tell him where you are taking him. And drive him straight to the person he spoke about. When you get there, say, and before the person said, two days ago, he said this about you, you know, sister or sir. That is scripture. That is scripture. You must care to believe nothing except Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. What about if somebody commits a sin among you, he fell? What has happened in many Christian churches is that among many Christians is that they will now take that sin and expound it. They will now amplify it and multiply it. You have corrected him. Having corrected him, you repeat it again. Whenever a little thing is happening, that is the wound you will give the blow to. Again and again. Did God do that to you? How many of you has God made you to confess all your sins here? Stand up. You have to start confessing your sins. <laughs> to the microphone so everybody can hear. And I've had situations where someone says that he hasn't confessed the sin to everybody. But all of you who are telling him to confess the sins to everybody, you also have sins to confess. If you don't have sin now, you had before. Isn't it? And you did not confess your own sins to others. Maybe you went to the secret or even go and say, God, I beg you, please don't let everybody know. Don't let anybody know. Forgive me and God forgive you. Don't apply, don't allow any human being to determine your decision. Decide on the will as it's written. Okay? Then you'll be fruitful. Someone says that when I go to preach to people, they don't want to hear. You are not in the world. Who said they don't want to hear? They are going to hell. Their spirit knows that they are going to hell. Their spirit wants salvation. It is abiding in the word, and the word is abiding in what? I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. The, the, the word is abiding in, in apostle. Okay, look at verse 1. That scripture. What did he say? Read it again. Aha. Uh -huh. Stop. If you connect this to verse 4, it says, my, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. So it means that God the father comes into the church. And anyone that is bearing fruit, he prunes it. That's what you read as you go further to verse 4. It says, anyone that the father, when he passes through the church, you may be crying. That doesn't make him prune you. It can be just a good emotion, you know. And it can be some sorrow, sorrow that has been hanging for some time. You are releasing the tears. Yeah? But he looks at somebody 
who had produced after salvation, somebody who has a curiosity to reveal him, and he will pick that person and reveal the person to other people, this is my beloved son. And things will begin to happen. When God holds your hand, Satan will, he will bow under you. When Jesus rode on the donkey, did men not praise the donkey? They worshiped the donkey. Really, their best clothes they put on the ground for donkey to pass. It's, it depends on who you're riding upon you. I want to go and think about this. If from January up to now you have no Brussels to the kingdom, between now and next Sunday, do something about it. That's a great word in it. Power. The Father will prune you. And maybe some of your prayers that have been hanging, it's only, it only needs one soul to be won by you. And manifestation will happen. So let's go and win many souls. And that is the key to unlocking the power of God. As God sent Jesus, Jesus sent you. Holy Ghost, what? Empowers you. See after me, God sent Jesus. God sent you. Jesus sent me. Jesus Holy Ghost empowers me. Ghost Stand up on your feet and let's pray. Spanning four decades, Apostle Alfred Williams has experienced numerous encounters with Jesus Christ and his holy angels, including being shown global events leading up to the year of 2015. Now, for the first time in this life-changing book, My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels, you can discover not only what was shown to the Apostle, but also how you can receive heavenly encounters for yourself. My Encounters with Jesus is a very powerful book. The Lord had taken me to heaven in the presence of the Father, a few times where decisions were made over nations. Apostle Alfred Williams is General Overseer of Christ Faith Tabernacle International Churches. He is a prophetic mouthpiece to nations, raising countless leaders and planting many churches. He has seen hundreds of signs and wonders, led huge scale crusades which have resulted in the salvation of many. Your life can change today. Get your copy of My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels by visiting cftchurches.org now. If you can only buy one book this year or are thinking of giving a life-changing gift to friends or family, make sure it is Alfred Williams' My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels. Also coming soon, don't miss Apostle Alfred Williams' four new groundbreaking titles, Shepherding God's People, Come Let Us Reason Together, The Minister's Manual and The Power of the Mind. If you can only buy one book this year, make sure it is Alfred Williams' My Encounters with Jesus and His Angels. Behold, I am coming soon. Between the years of 1984 and 1999, Apostle Alfred Williams was taken to heaven on various occasions where he was shown global events that would lead up to the year of 2015. And in 1999, the Apostle was powerfully shown the coming calendar for the world. I want you to understand that the first war was in heaven, the first victory was in heaven, and it takes the man of heaven to win the earthly battle. In December 2009, God instructed Apostle Alfred Williams to go into all the world and let them know that I am coming. Beloved, with this powerful instruction behind us, it is now time for us to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Now is the time for the final preparation of the Bride of Christ, a final trumpet call to righteousness in this time that is running out before the rapture of the church. Join us on this dynamic campaign to reach every house in Britain. They need to hear the call. Who will tell them if we do not? This is the prophesied time of harvest. It is now time for us to win every house for Jesus. For more information, call 020 7635 0447 or visit cftchurches.org. The time has come to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon.